Hey, welcome to the 163rd episode of Just Shoot It, a podcast about filmmaking, screenwriting, and directing. This episode is brought to you by Blake Robin and Amanda O'Connor. I'm Matt Enloe. And I'm Oren Kaplan. And today we have Noam Kroll on the show. He is a filmmaker, director, writer, colorist, editor, done all these things. Blogger, podcaster. What we found out through this interview, and Matt so eloquently pointed out, is he's pretty much 50% technical and 50% artsy fartsy yeah he's kind of like 80 percent artsy fartsy yeah which is the 50 percent of for non-artsy fartsy people he's like uh deep cuts do you know what i mean like he definitely dropped plenty of names i did not recognize what yeah i mean apparently there's some new wave in france yeah i don't know what that's about i think he appeals he's like 50 50 exactly down the middle of our listeners Mm -hmm. I, i kind of imagine our listeners are like half people that are pretty much their own production companies they're finding clients they're shooting things they're editing things they're producing things for other people for businesses for things um and then he's 50 percent like just a tour filmmaker you know writes directs casts makes uh, he's made two feature films yeah so it's a pretty cool conversation you know he's great on the mic he's been at it for a pretty long time now uh so it's a real treat to to sit down with him but before we talk to noam i want to talk about kicking butts Ooh, butt kicking <laughs> yeah All right uh in our may day competition may yeah. may month may we win yeah <laughs> <laughs> may the first filmmaking podcast get all the votes <laughs> I don't know. So uh, what Oren is alluding to rather clumsily is that... Uh, Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. We are in a friendly competition between a handful of filmmaking podcasts, Making Movies is Hard, Light the Fuse, and Respect the Process to see who can get the most iTunes reviews in the month of May. And the winner gets to write ad copy for all the other podcasts to read for the next month. So... Stakes couldn't be higher. Yeah. Regardless of what it means to us, I think it's just a, another way. If you're not into Patreon, if you're not into, you know, liking us on iTunes, just write a review. Just, I, I think it would honestly, like on a personal level, just mean so much if you guys yeah can write us a review and help us win this competition. Uh, and I, didn't the other podcast say they would quit podcasting if we win? Because mm-hmm. there'll be no point for them to podcast anymore. i mean i i can't imagine that they would want to carry on but uh but i don't know that that's official no just kidding it would be a bummer if those other great podcasts weren't around anymore right and just um so everyone's clear the review does not have to be positive feel yeah. free to leave us a negative review any review it's just uh quantity over quality <laughs> literally if you're just like here's your dumb review Oren. sure i would love it yeah at any rate uh friendly competition write us a review it'd be great and without any further ado yeah let's do it talk to noam kroll okay we are here with noam kroll glad to be here guys thanks any for relation it. to nick no but i get asked that probably on a weekly basis the more famous he gets the more often i get asked that but <laughs> any <laughs> no relation. relation to chomsky no, typically it's a last name thing. Yeah, that's but. not really how it, how it works. But so tell us what what do you what's your what's your deal? You direct, you shoot. You know, I I always say when people ask what I do, so I don't have too many hyphens. I just say filmmaker because for me everything falls under that umbrella. Mm-hmm. Um, I love business. I love um, being an entrepreneur. I have multiple businesses now. And um, I love making movies more than anything. Um, and I love both the art and the business of it. So there are so many, so many different avenues that that has allowed me to pursue, uh, which I enjoy most of them. And the ones that I don't, I've sort of filtered those parts out mm-hmm. of my working life. But, um, but yeah, now my day-to-day really consists of making whatever passion project is on my plate. So at the moment, it's my feature film we shot a couple of months ago called Psychosynthesis. We just finished um, the festival cut, so we're submitting that to festivals. Congrats. That you, Thank you. directed. I wrote, directed, produced. It, it was very, you Read know, it. The DP also? No, no. I had a, a great DP, Matteo Bertoli, um, who I was 
fortunate to have on the project. Uh, he just moved here from Italy and he was actually here just for a month, like literally while we were shooting the movie. Um, and it, it just ended up working out really well. Um, but yeah, so there's the film side and then I also have a blog, a podcast, as you guys know, and, um, and other businesses. So there's a whole lot that I'm juggling, but the goal is to have all of it really serve my ability to have as much time to be creative as possible and to work on movies as possible. And, uh, that it sounds a little counterintuitive because I'm always juggling a lot of things, but, um, I've. I've, I think, picked uh, over time, sort of found the right things to juggle so mm -hmm. I can uh, make make an income but not kill myself with, uh, uh, you know, 80-hour weeks every week and no time to write or edit sure. or direct sure. something. Well, is it structured in any way, your creative time, passion project time versus entrepreneur business time? So the only structure I really have is that over 50% of my time, I, I made the decision quite a while ago that at least 50% of my time has to be dedicated to making movies, whether it's mm -hmm. writing, whether it's editing, being on set. Um, in the past, I had probably tricked myself into believing I was spending more time making movies than I actually was. Mm -hmm. I always considered myself a filmmaker and a director, but when I would actually break down how much time I was spending making movies versus doing corporate work or doing this or that, mm -hmm. uh, it was such a small percentage. So now my, I always tell people my busiest weeks on the business side, whether it's running my business or doing commercial work or, or corporate work, I have to match that with creative work. So mm -hmm. if I have 30 hours a week of something non-film, filmmaking related, I'm guaranteeing myself, I'm going to put in 30 more on a, on a film. Otherwise, um, you know, it, for me, it's a lot harder to go to sleep at night when I haven't put in the creative work, mm -hmm. uh, it, than just spending those crazy hours on certain weeks. Like I said before, thankfully those weeks now are not as common as they used to be, but, um, but yeah, it, it's always, it's always trying to find a balance and, and, you know, to your question, I don't have a very rigid schedule where it's like, okay, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'm working on my movie Tuesday, Thursday, something else. It's just, uh, it's just trying to be cognizant day by day and make sure that very few days go past where I'm not, I'm actually working on, on something creatively satisfying. Mm -hmm. But what if you have like a corporate job, you're working on it, you know, you, you're prepping on Monday, you're shooting it on Tuesday, maybe you're sitting in on the edit on Wednesday and they're kind of all day long. And then someone calls you and it's like, Hey, on Thursday, uh, will you come meet with us on this new project for another commercial? So that's definitely happened. And I mean, my system is by no means flawless. However, I typically, uh, I, the one thing I'm pretty good at, and I'm, I'm bad at many things, but one thing that I'm pretty good at is protecting my own time. So I very rarely have meetings with anybody. I pretty much never have a meeting. This This is the most, the longest I'll have sat with two other humans other than, you know, my wife <laughs> yeah. or family, sure. um, for, for probably years. Uh, I just find for, for me in the way that I like to operate and run my business, it's just not productive. I find a five minute email can sometimes save two hours of, mm -hmm. of, you know, talking in, in a boardroom somewhere. Wait, uh, so you don't do meetings. So not, not really. No, I mean, I'll do meetings, I'll do creative meetings where it matters. So mm -hmm. if I need to meet, let's say with my cinematographer, but those that to me is is more of a artistic process than when I say I don't do meetings, I'm talking about the meaningless, what I consider to be meaningless um, uh, corporate style meetings where it's a bunch of, of different people in the room trying to solve a problem that I think could get solved very easily mm -hmm. over email or over a quick phone call. Or maybe you don't even know what problem you're solving. Right? Exactly. And when you, you kind of schedule this meeting, you, you have this feeling that everyone there has to be um, you know, the, the meeting Im almost imposes a certain quality of the discussion mm -hmm. on it. So for me, I mean, uh, like I said, if I have a client that needs me on a, a phone meeting or something, 
no problem. If I have to be in an in-person meeting, I'll be there. But I try to minimize meetings as much as possible. I try to minimize any wasted time. Uh, what about media. like if another filmmaker says, hey, let's go grab lunch? Oh, sure. With sure. no agenda. Oh, that's that's different. Yeah. I mean, to clarify, that's that's not the kind of meeting I'm talking about. Like friendly meetings. I have all the time in the world to sit down mm-hmm. with, with friends and, and, you know, get a coffee or whatever. But But I'm talking about like... You know, again, I, I have a, a business background as as you guys do, uh, I'm sure as well. So it's just for me when I say meeting, I'm talking about a business meeting, sitting mm-hmm. down. Okay, here's an agenda. This is what we're going to go over. Sure. You know, let's have these specific talking points, address yeah. these issues. It's, it's just when you're in the more like day jobby sort of filmmaking side. Yes. You know? Yeah. I, I think we do. Uh, we're lucky in that. I think we both can avoid a lot of that. You'll still have like the the big pre PPM or like or PBM or you know creative meetings, but what I mean is the the kind of the circle up of like we should just be reply alling to everyone at this meeting instead of just like kind of all bullshitting for an hour. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I it's get just you. it's not efficient for me at least. I think everyone has their own system, their own way that they they like to operate. But yeah, for me, uh, I just find email calls short calls that's that's kind of how that's the move yeah yeah wait so let me ask you this so you worked on your film your feature film for like a month straight non-stop does that mean you get to do a month of non-creative work <laughs> no it doesn't work and not non-creative it, work right yeah, more sorry, just like your your business non-passion right? yeah, yeah oh yeah yeah but i mean for me running my business is as long as I'm enjoying what I'm doing, that's my only metric of whether or not I should be doing something. I don't care. You know, a lot of people I think get very wrapped up in defying themselves as I'm a director, I'm an entrepreneur, Mm -hmm. I'm this, I'm that. People can call me whatever they want. I don't even know what I am half the time. All I know is I have to be enjoying what I'm doing. I have to be putting my time into something that I believe in, whether that's my business or a film. And I'll put, um, you know, I'll pull 20 hour days for either of those things mm-hmm. if I need to. Uh, but again, I find so for me, because I'm, I'm a big believer in operating as um, what some people now might refer to as a company of one. Um, it was so this book, Company of One, is it's written by Paul Jarvis. It's a great, great book. Came out, I think, this year. And it really spoke to me personally because I've always been someone who loves business and loves entrepreneurial uh, endeavors, but I don't necessarily... Um, enjoy the process of managing people. Um, Mm -hmm. I like creating systems that are automated. I like uh, working with freelancers, working with other third-party businesses that I can outsource Mm -hmm. things to and have uh, ideally sort of benefit from the way that many other businesses operate, but without the same type of infrastructure and red tape. Mm -hmm. So this book really spoke to that and talks about, I think there's a statistic in there. I may be getting this wrong, but it's something like 70% of um, U.S. corporations that make over a million dollars a year are actually owned and operated by a single person. Mm -hmm. And some of those are real estate, you know, they're all, all different businesses. Mm -hmm. Um, but I've always sort of put that philosophy into um, into my work, and I've always tried to find ways to uh, essentially have business, a business or now multiple businesses, without having to have full-time employees. I've had them in the past, and um, I'm just someone who's super hands-on. I'd mm-hmm. rather be working on things or collaborating with people than managing people and and. Uh, keeping tabs and telling them what to do. It's just not, it's not what I'm best at. It's not what my personality um, gels with Mm -hmm. as much. So anyway, so um, yeah, I I love, uh, I love the idea of um, operating in that way, but you guys should definitely check out that book if if you, if you haven't. Company uh, of One? Company of One, yeah. It's super, super interesting. Um, Does that mean I have to fire Oren? Yeah, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, right, should I? You do. You're fired, Matt. Oh, no. Yo, oh, no you first. Beat me. Sorry. Beat me to it. Shit. So, the, well, the great thing about the book, and, and for anyone listening, it's it's not 
just relevant to someone like myself or like you guys who has a business and works in a creative field, although it, it does lean toward that. Um, but it even goes to the extent of thinking as a business owner, thinking as an entrepreneur, if you are an employee at a company and how you can essentially um, almost be a company within a company and uh, and really leverage your time more effectively. So again, I always, for me, it's always a common thread. I always come back to just protecting my time. Yeah, I can't wait till you have your kid. I know, that right? All goes out the door. Well, well, I told you I already built the the soundproof pod. Sure. That that might only help me for half yes. an hour a day. But hopefully, your wife likes you. <laughs> oh, she does. She, does. <laughs> she helped me build the pod. So sure, so I'm, I've, I've, she's I've got like, a uh, start. I thought that pod was for me. Now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, right. it might be. We'll, we'll see. We can convert it into a tiny little. Sure. Well, you know what I think is really fascinating to me about this is one of the big lessons we have on the podcast is like learning how people kind of cobble together a career, right? Mm-hmm. And there's always going to be those passion projects. Sometimes those are fully funded by other entities and sometimes you know you just have to self-start on them right you sometimes you just have to just shoot it right um but i think on the spectrum there's always people who are doing a number of different things but what's fascinating to me about you is that you have multiple filmmaking businesses but in unique ways right whereas i think oren and i will just you know shoot some commercials or something like that that's like a little less self-sustaining and a little less what's the word i'm looking for less pa- you have more passive incomes it sounds like right you've built kind of yes. self-sustaining businesses in that a way. little andrew kramerish in a way oh and yeah that's a great reference i i learned after effects through that sure. site years as i can't wait to meet someone probably. who didn't yeah you know exactly. what I mean? but you know he like has he sells so much stuff oh, he yeah. has a company that makes products so i have a few thoughts about everything you just said one is i, I love the label filmmaker a lot more than content creator (laughs) what we were talking about last week um because it does encompass all that stuff how do you matt when you introduce yourself to like your parents friends and they ask you what you do what do you say say director because i think that that's a little easier for people to wrap their heads around Mm -hmm. they kind of know what that is yes filmmaker uh i'm not opposed to but i guess uh i just haven't said it but i I also i don't touch many things do you know sure. what i mean i'm more i think a, i'm a writer director basically yeah. straight up yeah well, i was gonna say i mean that's what i i gather as well is that although we could all call each other really any variation of these these titles um if you're if you're really focused so s- more specifically on directing i think that that makes it more of a clear distinction i mean let me ask you this because this is a question i always get from people and it actually came up on a, a, another podcast i did we were talking about this topic of filmmakers that are essentially afraid to call themselves directors they don't know oh, at sure. what point they yeah. are allowed what at what point they've earned it so i'm curious like i have my own version of of how i like to approach that and how i have approached it but i'm curious as to if that's come up with you guys is that something people have asked you about in the past yeah it's a topic that people bring up i feel like just go for it mm-hmm. you know what i mean yep i'll say most of the people that we've had on this podcast are directors, you know, and that's why when we introduce them, we will say like, they directed this and this is why they're on the podcast. So they're a director. Sure. Uh, And we have had some guests that didn't want to come on because they felt like they hadn't directed anything recently and they felt guilty Mm -hmm. to be called directors. Uh, But I think there's kind of either, there's one of two ways you can go. One, either you get paid to direct Yep. then it's very easy to say you're a director. You know, yep. whether it's like 100% of your salary or 50% or 25%, you know, I think that's one thing. And then the other thing is a little related to what you were saying. It's like, where do you spend your time? If mm-hmm. you're spending most of your time trying to get a film off the ground, making shorts, writing, going to film festivals, film competitions, anything in that world of making your movie, then whether you get paid for it or not, I don't think it matters. You're yeah, like a you director. could be an accountant that also is a director. Yes. After yeah. hours, I, you, I would say you still call yourself a director. Exactly. Think, yeah. No, the I, only time you, sh- I feel like you wouldn't call yourself a director is if you really want to be a director, but you're literally doing nothing to that exactly. end. Exactly. And that, for me, that's the the barometer because mm-hmm. I think you know, and again, not to always bring it back to the business side of things, but 
if someone calls themselves an entrepreneur, they can call themselves that to me and they could be making no money. They could be in debt and failing and they could be an entrepreneur. They might not be succeeding as an entrepreneur, sure. but they're doing it. They're trying it. So, And plenty of successful entrepreneurs started out in debt. Oh, Do you yeah. know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Like, you have to fail. Right. I mean, it's it's like, you know, uh, Mark Cuban always says, you only have to be right once. You know, it's, right. it's the more... <laughs> he you, would say that. He would. <laughs> you know, and it's, it's, it's true, though. I mean, you try, you try so many different things, and this applies to filmmaking, too. And eventually, you if you stick with whatever you're doing long enough, you get better at it, you get more clients, people believe in you, they're willing to pay you for, for your time. So for me, when I talk to filmmakers and uh, if they ask me, you know, when, when should I call myself that? Um, first of all, I'm not necessarily the person to ask. I don't, I, there's no, no one person that's the judge uh, on that. But my, my approach to it is don't call yourself a director until you've actually directed something of your own um it don't say because you want to direct a feature don't get, say it because you want to direct a short and the only reason i use that i don't care if it's a two dollar feature film that nobody ever sees mm -hmm. it's just i think we usually when people ask me that question it's people who have not really directed anything substantial yet and i think psychologically whether it's a subconscious thing or not what they're really wanting me to say is go just shoot it because mm -hmm. when you make that sure. movie you have earned the right you can make the worst movie in the world and you're still a director it doesn't matter if it's yeah, good or you're bad you're just a bad director you're just yeah exactly that's fine well let me ask you this yeah. let's say you met someone a, yeah, a young a young person yeah yeah that has a hundred thousand followers on instagram mm -hmm. and they do selfie videos shot vertically where they just talk to the camera about what they're doing that day and then you ask them like hey what would you do and if they said they're a director <laughs> would that bother you at all well that yeah because i think that is if they said if they qualified it with uh, i direct social media content or something then I, i'd maybe be okay with it but but yeah i think the directing is by nature a collaborative art form you have to work i don't care what aspect ratio it's shot in but i do care if other people are involved and if you know at least one other whether it's an actor whether it's um whoever that you're it, directing someone yeah you have to be directing and that's something i i would <laughs> counter actually i think that there's probably incredible films out there that are one person bands sure right especially I, documentary documentary yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but maybe it's more about the craft or the attempt at craft that we're really that's talking a, about. Yeah, that's that's a better way to put it. Um, it's the attention to detail. Uh, social media content is live. So again, just the nature of it, not necessarily it, it lives live forever, but if you go on Instagram and post a story, it's effectively a live experience even if it's not mm -hmm. actually a live stream. it's like a it's video tweet yeah. yeah so there's no ability to do post-production on that there's no ability to uh, decide between different takes so once you remove any of the decision making out of it i don't know if you can qualify that as a directing job because if there's one sure. and only thing a director does it's make decisions well you can um, decide what clothes you're wearing what you're I gonna mean, say and sure, sure look sure. and this yeah. is just a thought experiment but i would say if a one person band had an incredibly thought through awesome single take vertically shot Instagram experience that was meant to only be experienced one time, but had yes. like, you know, an interesting narrative hook and an idea and like was planned out and like yeah. had some theatricality to it. I think we'd all be okay with calling that person a director. Oh, sure. Yeah. And right. I think there are, there are vines like six second vine sure. videos that are probably better directed than a lot of feature films I've sure. seen in in a, in a weird way. So I totally agree with your point. Um, but yeah, I see where you're coming from too. Cause I think what you were probably referring to or with your question was whether it's, if it's someone who, who isn't focused on the craft and is really just focused on, well, I have an audience. So is that, mm -hmm. cause you mentioned a hundred thousand followers or whatever. Or I, make so, a, I make videos. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know what, at the end of the day, I don't know if there's ever going to be a hard and fast rule, but for me, again, I always 
think of things from the narrative perspective. I love documentaries. I love all sorts of other me- media as well. But it, for me, it always comes down to narrative. And I think the number one thing that qualifies someone as a director to me, besides having actually done something, which is, is obviously a given, is their ability to work with actors and their interest in working with mm-hmm. actors. And I think a lot of directors, you know, in quotations, directors, when they're starting, they're not actually really interested in directing they're often interested in camera visual effects um, cinematography and those are facets of directing Um, but i to me and maybe i'm just super traditional in this way but acting is always number one and i'm the most if anyone's been on my blog they know i love cameras i love gear i love you know every aspect of editing and color correction all that but if i could only do one thing and I could not do all those things. No question, work with actors, throw everything else out. I just, I enjoy it the most. I think it's the most important skill to have as a director. And I think that if you're not focused on that, I don't care what budget you're working on. I don't care who your crew is. I don't care, you know, what festival your film got into. To me, that is the measure of, of, of someone who's approaching it, in my opinion, from the right perspective. And that's just me. But Even though, you know, you can talk about like Alfred Hitchcock or Clint Eastwood or Woody Allen, um, and none of those guys are known for talking to actors. No, but they understood acting. And like someone like Alfred Hitchcock, I'm a huge fan of his. I mean, he is so, so masterful in the sense that he's not going to cast somebody who's not going to deliver mm-hmm. the exact performance that he wants it, you know if but he, he was also famous for being like okay look left look right open your eyes sure. do this and here's some cold totally. water scream and okay we but got that's, what we need. that's valid <laughs> and some actors like that i mean on the feature i i just directed um we had two completely different types of actors mm-hmm. one clearly coming from more of a method approach one clearly coming from more, more of a, a meisner background and they need to be spoken to in very very different ways i'm yeah. sure you guys have experienced what a that. pain <laughs> to have those two schools represent <laughs> in a single film. <laughs> well no but i mean it's it's totally different i mean you sure. have one person uh, and i don't know how much uh, have you guys taken any acting classes we're both married to actors so. okay so <laughs> so, so you by guys, proxy so I Taken, yeah. Oh yeah. Have you taken acting classes? Yeah, I UCLA. I took like oh, yeah. in the theater school. Some, but um, but so you you understand the difference? I took one class that was like acting for directors. Also, oh, gotcha. which is, but that's great. And you know, I I used to take a lot. I don't. I haven't taken an acting class in a couple of years. But I'll try to every so often just to sort of sharpen the the tools a little bit and. Um, I just find it so fun and liberating and educational and, and I feel like I grow so much from learning from actors and I respect actors so much because films are nothing without talent and I think actors are often treated as in a way especially in lower budget projects somewhat disposable when you're dealing with and I'm talking micro budget I'm not talking about you know fully budgeted independent films but on a micro budget production Everybody is is obsessed with the camera. I can't remember who I heard. I think I heard someone on on say this on Howard Stern recently. I can't remember who it was, but someone said that you know it used to be the actor was the star, and that's where the director gave their attention. And now the camera is the star. Everyone's huddled around the camera and the monitor, mm-hmm. and the actors are not always getting getting that attention. So, but to your point about someone like Alfred Hitchcock, I don't think it's about the way that someone directs the actors. I think it's about that person making sure that they get the performance that they Mm -hmm. want from the actor. If that means look left, look right, great. If that means a five-hour discussion about the backstory of the character, that's cool too. Whatever the actor needs and whatever the director needs Mm -hmm. to to make that work. I just, to me, again, it's, it's more about getting that performance if you can get that performance whatever method you use to me that's that's a a great indication of somebody who's heading in the right direction as as a director cool i wanted to ask you about where you feel like you fit in hollywood because so you've used you've used the word client a lot which is like a word that i assume that like a martin scorsese or ryan coogler probably doesn't use that much like, I think there doesn't need to be like a specific end goal, but you just talked so uh, passionately about working with actors. I um, mean, at the same time, you, you know, have a business that sells LUTs, you know, like they just seem 
obviously they're all about filmmaking, you know, different aspects of it, like you're talking about. You seem kind of like a, like you want to unplug from Hollywood, but also you have kind of these Hollywood aspirations. Do that, so, do, are those at odds with each other? Hollywood roots in an interesting way. Yes. Right? So I love Hollywood as a place. I love Los Angeles from the second I knew what Los Angeles was. All I wanted to do was, was live here. And I'm super grateful to be here. At the same time, um, I'm not that interested in Hollywood as a business. I think, you know, I work with a lot of tech companies. So when I talk about clients, um, without, you know, going through the list, um, some of my clients specifically in the tech space are some of the largest corporations in the world. Um, and when I've worked with those kind of clients and I've seen the way that they operate, the way that they run their businesses. And then I see friends of mine who've come up through the studio system and work in studio filmmaking. Uh, I mean, again, anyone's guess is as good as mine but if i had to uh, put money on which of these systems is going to be sustainable over the next decade i wouldn't be betting on the hollywood system as it is now i love movies i don't necessarily love hollywood movies so if i had the opportunity you know people sometimes you know look at directors and or ask directors like what what's your ideal sort of career path or you know, what would that look like? And for me, as much as I love the Steven Spielbergs of the world and the Ryan Kuglers of the world, and I admire their work so deeply, um, that's not ever what I want to do. That's not what I aspire to do. I, you know, I look at directors who put out consistent work. Um, like uh, there, there's a director, Francois Ozan. I don't know if you know him. He mm-hmm, did yeah. Swimming Pool. That was probably his biggest mm-hmm. film here. He's a French director. He'll direct a movie maybe once every year, once every two years. And they will, for the most part, from what I could tell, make some money. They're not going to be the next Star Wars. But at the same time, he has total creative freedom. He can take risks. He can make movies that... Uh, you, you just would never get made on a higher budget. So to me, that's what's exciting. Um, and that's kind of the, you know, the punk rock background. I, I came up through music and I used to listen to a lot of punk. But, in, you know, I've always felt like, especially at this age, when I look back, that that's something that's that's still a part of my personality is just, you know, don't do things just for the money. If I was just going to do this for the money or to do a, a blockbuster level production which is an impossible goal to even have um i would just be doubling down on my business because it's Mm -hmm. way easier to make money doing so many other things um right right i don't think it's about the money but if you look like it and like a ryan coogler or an alex garland or um you know ava duvernay like it's not just because they're making big commercial studio projects doesn't mean they're not excited and passionate about that no no no. and i'm I'm not talking about them I'm, i'm just going back to your question about um you know, if you are, you know, you know, you asked if I, why I refer to people as clients, sure. it's because no, 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 they I, are I, my clients. I understand yeah. that. And I think we've had clients as well, but like, sure. we, at least I personally do try to push more towards like, what's a bigger budget I can get for this movie and yes. work, work with this big, bigger actor oh, yeah. and bigger DP. And yeah. It's, it's kind of a funny, you know, we're at a funny, uh, period in time with filmmaking, right? Because um, fewer and fewer of those million dollar, $2 million, $10 million movies are being made, right? Mm -hmm. You kind of, if you want to make full budget, like big budget movies, Mm -hmm. they kind of have to be like big spectacle family films, right? PG-13 movies. And so, you know, it's a bummer, right? Because you want to be able to have the resources to take the time to do it right, to do it over like a large scale, to have like a fully fleshed out team and everything and to be able to do all the previs and mm-hmm. do it right. Right. But you know, um, I mean, but what about a movie like the lobster or I, like, uh, yeah, sure. One like, of my, my favorite working directors and, too. I mean, like, yeah. if you, you can look make at, commercial films that aren't a hundred million dollar, take a look at the, at the yeah. favorite though. Right. Like that movie is pretty cheap. Do you I know think? what I mean? Yeah, dude, take a look at it. There's a ton of natural lighting. They not shooting a ton of setups. It's like, cool costumes an awesome cast and like but those lenses though so yeah wide. they're so wide yeah um no but the cast i mean you don't think they're getting like a few million dollars each? no i don't think that they well that's getting that much money exactly and that's kind of a question i was going to ask to just volley it back to you guys but when it comes to budget so for me when i think of my objectives as a filmmaker 
money doesn't factor into it. Yes, if I need money to accomplish a specific creative goal, I would and will go after that money. And I've had opportunities in the past to raise private equity, for example, for my last feature. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to do it because it wasn't the right project to do that on. I wanted to have more control. I wanted to experiment more with it. And in the future, when I do that, it will be for the right project, but it also be when I need it. So I never st- stop down for one second. Sure. How many features have you directed? So I've done two features. The first feature I did was was well under hundred, um, and it, for me again, it's always about what does the film need to get made. And you see, you see movies getting made like High Life. Have you guys seen that? The new Claire Denis. No, film? How do you, how'd you like it? So I haven't seen it. Um, I want, I very much want to see it. I'm a big fan of hers. And um, you look at a film like that, or you look at a film like the, the movies the Safdie brothers are doing, um, you know, and they're working with Robert Pattinson. So sure. that's, I guess, the connection between those two. Uh, he's he's a, obviously a very well-known star and could have taken a different path, but he's working on lower budget films. So I think, you know, my curiosity but is... But that movie he did... That's not a hundred thousand dollar movie. Right? No, no, of course. But I mean, when we're comparing, for all intents and purposes, you know, a, a two or three million dollar movie is is the same to me as uh, when you're talking about talent. Mm-hmm. One million dollar, five hundred thousand. I have like friends. Like indie versus studio is what it boils down. Yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, but but I have you know I have friends, and again, I, I'm not sure if they would want me sharing these details or not. So I'm not going to say who or which films. But I have m- several friends that have made independent films well under a million probably under 500,000 with very recognizable talent because they love the script they love the idea they're working for $125 a day and it's a passion project for them because they want to be in something that's interesting so my my whole thing is you know if if I felt that I could only do something with X amount of dollars and I was so passionate about that idea, I would absolutely go out and raise that money and, and do it that way. I And I plan to. I'm developing another film now that very much fits into that category. But if I don't need it, um, I don't want to spend it. And again, that's just the business owner in me. It's like, it's why would I spend more than I need to to create the product that I'm after, you know? Because it's tiring. Because... I've worked on very, a ton of low-budget movies, you know, yeah. like the hundred thousand dollar movies, the two hundred thousand, the fifty thousand dollar micro budget. When I first moved to LA, I, that's like all I worked on. Sure. And I've done two, well, one indie film and one TV movie that I, you had a smaller budget than the indie film starring Laurie Lachlan. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah, okay, yeah. we got to get in. That'll yeah. be a whole other episode. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, like our friend Eben, you know, he produced like three two hundred fifty thousand dollar movies in a row, and he's like. That's it, dude. It's like all these favors, all these things, all these permits, and then you're killing yourself. And then the producers are trying to beg people to. And at some point, you're like, I just want people to want to work with me, you know, and yeah. I want to pay them a fair wage. Paying them the fair wage is the thing. You know, and I want people yeah. to, and I want to work with the best people in the business. And yeah, if you just did a full season of The Good Place, you know, and now I want you to work on my movie. But I'm, you're working with a bunch of like amateurs and you're not getting paid anything. It's, it's hard to convince you to do that instead of spend time with your family. For sure. Well, I think again, and once com- you do have a family, it's like gets even harder to go make that hundred thousand dollar film because you're like, I'm killing myself, you know? Yeah. And well, it-, it comes down to your values. And I hear you. Like I spoke about this on Indie Film Hustle. I did, I did that with Alex Ferrari. I'm not sure if you guys have had him on, um, but we were talking about when I did my first feature, I literally got sick for like six months after I was, and, and <laughs> it, it, you're laughing, but like no, it, was, no, it wasn't a joke. Sucks. Like, but it's I not, was, it's not surprising. Cause yeah. people literally are like, you look like Christian Bale in the mechanic, like at the yeah. end of these. Movies. Oh my God. Yeah. Like it was, it was intense. And, but the thing is what I learned from that was I could, not put myself in that situation if I made different creative decisions the next time around. So this time around, I'm not saying there weren't, trust me, like we had all sorts of issues. I don't, I don't even want to get into it right now, but it was not nearly as bumpy of a ride. I got eight hours of sleep every single night. We wrapped early on a lot of days. We had no pickups. It was very smooth. The edit was smoother. I just made decisions that were built into the DNA of the idea 
and built into how I built my cast and crew. Mm-hmm. And with all due respect, you know, to my crew, they are, in my opinion, um, they are worth their weight in gold. Everyone has paid well. They may not be coming off of some whatever the hot show is this week, but my only metric again is like what is the quality of their work i don't you know to me it i hear you like as a business person yeah it's nice to have in the pr package that so and so was worked on your film and they came off of this show or it's nice to have the confidence in knowing that you're working with someone who came off of some huge film and and i i hope or even i mean when we're talking about like 125 bucks a day yeah you mean like a person who's come off a few real films, right? Like a, a like a teenager who's not going to hit the grip truck on the side of the oh, house. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. I'm not. I'm not you paying I mean? anyone 125 bucks a day. You know, that's the other thing is like I invest in people. You mm-hmm. know, I put my money where my mouth is. I pay my crew as much as I possibly can without totally going broke. Um, you know, I'll I'll do everything in my power to make sure people are in a good environment, they're well paid, they're well fed, mm-hmm. and you don't need millions of dollars to do that. You just need fewer days and you need creative choices along the way that allow you to not try to make a blockbuster in 15 days. You know, mm-hmm. you can't make those kind of movies. So Was that I, your shoot schedule, 15 days? Um, no, nine days. So we oh, shot, yeah. a few, my last movie was 15 days and the first cut was shorter than this one. It was an absolute nightmare to piece together and post. And this one was nine days. We had an abundance of footage. It was it was a completely, completely opposite experience. So let me ask then, beyond having the experience of understanding what the right idea is, right? Which yeah. is invaluable, right? Like sure. that is That is probably really the silver bullet in terms of being able to make a good movie in nine days, right? Yeah. Are there other actionable things that you could recommend for someone else to do like yeah what, what were your what are your philosophies and strategies to make a movie in shoot on an iphone well it, you know a lot of it comes down to your creative sensibilities and whether or not it lines up so for some people the unfortunate answer is it may not always line up with their vision so even story aside if you're just the type of director that likes a lot of coverage mm-hmm. that's going to be a challenge i'm super minimalist my favorite films are often films where there's little to no coverage or you know what one of my favorite favorite films of all time is called lore uh i don't know if you guys have seen that it's a brilliant brilliant film um it's a foreign film about these uh children after world war ii in nazi germany and their parents were nazis and they were taken away and these german kids have to basically trek across uh across the country uh war-torn germany it's it's fascinating um anyway uh, that film to me is is the prime example of coverage done right for my taste. So mm-hmm. they might have a scene if the three of us are sitting here where there's basically a master of the whole scene. Maybe the camera's moving. Maybe there's some dynamic blocking or whatever. Um, but then there's just these like brilliant insert shots that work and could almost be placed anywhere in the scene to open it or to pepper in Mm -hmm. and that gives you all the options that you need in the edit but it doesn't necessarily uh, take the same amount of time as Mm -hmm. it would to shoot everybody's dialogue from a different angle Um, some people would suggest you know to your question of like practically what you can do so number one i'd say if you're open to little coverage shoot less coverage but make sure you still get enough angles that you don't uh shoot yourself in the foot in the edit um but i think uh you know there's so many other things that you can do if you if you're open to minimalism you know Mm -hmm. i think that's what it comes down to yeah or rather if your idea matches a minimalist aesthetic exactly yeah Yeah. exactly and and i think typically if if you have that idea and if your idea comes from a place of minimalism and of simplicity chances are you probably think that way visually too Mm -hmm. maybe not but most people i know that love tons of coverage when i see a script that they wrote there's a lot of moving parts on the page too because that's probably how their their Mm -hmm. brain works so Um, you know, I say that that's one thing, you know, some people say shoot with two cameras or three cameras. Um, I, I, again, I'm super old school in that way. I I like just having one camera and just 
focusing on the one thing. I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not as well tuned to work with multiple cameras, but some people would, would say that that's I like an to option. shoot with what I call one and a half cameras. Okay. Yeah. So let, tell me. So basically one and a half is like when it's convenient, you know, if you're not changing lighting setups in a dramatic way, oftentimes it basically just means stacked. So you're getting two sizes at once. That's handy. But as soon as you're compromising, as soon as you're shooting crosses, right, and your lighting is compromised or your eye lines are compromised to get like that shot reverse shot, that's when it can be a mistake. And it's oftentimes better and faster just to shoot single cam. That's really smart. I've never heard of that exact approach. Um, but it's interesting because on our film, on our feature, we, we didn't actually do that but we kind of could have done that because we had a, a bts um shooter basically mm -hmm. someone just filming behind the scenes and he, without telling me he was actually essentially shooting b cam on a lot of the scenes uh i didn't end up using it because it was it just didn't match it wasn't this it wasn't on the alexa so mm -hmm. the color science was different and it was handheld for some of it so it, it wasn't a perfect match however um i did think to myself at the time huh like if we decided to actually do mm -hmm. this properly before i definitely could have used you some of this yeah, stuff yeah yeah, yeah so. you could have sniped off some of those great inserts you're talking about exactly yeah i've 100%. had like bts crews when we're doing like a big like an explosion or something's falling over or some big stunt and i'll be like hey can you get that like clean without the crew in it yeah, <laughs> just yeah. when that happens <laughs> just in case and then i'll tell the dat to like make sure to get that well sure. it's smart. that's really like, funny why, why yeah. wouldn't you yeah. you know and i kick myself sometimes even on this film for not doing it because there was a couple of times when i said well it's not gonna match and i should know i i spent years doing color grading and i know how close you can get two different cameras but um yeah, I mean, I, I just didn't push for it, but yeah. I, I probably could have and should have, for sure. So you were shooting Alexa, he was on, like, an A7S, basically? He was on uh, Blackmagic, gotcha. Ursa yeah. Mini, which yeah. is a great camera, but yeah. it just, uh, you know, it doesn't, it, it's not exact. And the other thing is, we shot, the whole movie is framed in 4 by 3 and he's shooting everything in uh, six, sure. 16 by 9 sure, so sure. it wasn't, nothing would even be framed properly, really. I love shooting 4 by 3 because it makes me feel like a kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what That's I mean? That's why I did it. You're yeah. like, oh man, it's like backyard home movies. Exactly. Yeah, How, it's fun. It, it brings up another, I'll do another book recommendation. I'm sure you guys have, have either read or heard of uh, The Artist's Way. Have you guys read mm, that one? Sure, yeah. So, uh, it, and you've both read it or you've heard, heard of it? My wife was... My That's wife the 750 is, words. Yeah, yeah. My wife is at like... Write the longhand writing in the morning. Yeah, yes. yeah. Morning pages. Yeah, yeah the morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. She's been doing morning pages for... 1500 consecutive days that's amazing <laughs> yeah. five years almost yeah Four yeah years. it's insane wow. yeah and so i guess for anyone listening if you're not familiar with the concept basically this book outlines this this notion that and this isn't actually what i was going to touch on but it, it's really fascinating as a separate thing but you know you wake up every day and you write four pages it doesn't matter what it is you could be saying i don't want to write today but you just get into the habit it's about habit forming and about creative flow and just letting your inner critic basically get out of the way so one thing that really struck me from reading that book was uh, julia cameron talks a lot about thinking of your filmmaking or thinking of your artwork as play as basically like your kid you're having fun because that's when you know every you know, you have a three-year-old, she's probably super creative in every way. You you know, a 10-year-old's going to be super creative. Any 10-year-old is going to have a lot of creativity, but you get older and older and older and people stop learning how to play. They start censoring themselves. They start thinking, well, I would write this script, but maybe so-and-so won't like mm -hmm. it. So the idea is to get the critic out of the way. The reason I chose to frame this movie in four by three is because I didn't want to take it seriously in that way i wanted to you know another expression i love is care enough not to care which i uh, an acting it's another acting thing that i've heard from an acting teacher years and years ago um but the idea was first of all i love four by three format i'm a huge like french new wave guy and i love old you know cla so many classic films and my favorites are What's shot that? In have you seen ida oh yeah yeah ida oh, and cold war the new one i i that was four by three right yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. black and white Shot on Alexa. Yeah. For, I love yeah. both of those, but but Ida in particular 
So good. Yeah, Ida is uh, a beautifully, beautifully done film, beautifully shot film. And, you know, so anyway, getting back to your four by three point, it was like, or talking about having fun, like, Mm -hmm. you know, your kid with your camera. And that's what it was. It was like every time we framed up a shot, it was kind of not a throwaway in the sense that we didn't care, but a throwaway in the sense that like, this is fun. We're not we're not trying to strive for perfection. We're trying to st- strive for a, a fun, collaborative, unique piece of art that we're making. And by imposing that limitation on everything, we had to be cognizant of that every single step of the yeah. way. And and I, I think it really helped. It also forces you to rethink your own aesthetics. And this is true for basically any non-standard uh, aspect ratio. Like as soon as you're not in 16.9, you have to be like, well, why do I think this is good? Yeah. You know, like how, like framing any shot up all of a sudden, it's not second nature the way like a 69 shot you can, you know, you do it with your phone nonstop. Right. Yes. So like just being forced to think through what do I like about this image? Why am I putting the camera where it is? Is really interesting. Exactly. And I, I love when anyone breaks that mold. Like, uh, what was the film a couple of years ago? A ghost story. Did you guys see yeah. that one? one by one aspect ratio yeah. and it was perfect for that movie he was yeah. really just like instagram is really coming wait it's but didn't he thing. it's like in a couple aspect ratios right the whole no thing no no that no. Was... that's all one by one from what i remember yeah it's all one by one and you know not that everything has to be that but i find it interesting and this is another topic that often comes up that there's more content by far and away made you know now obviously than ever before but I kind of feel like there's less, not just on the Hollywood level, by the way, like even on the super low budget level, like there's less experimentation than ever. Um, And at least there is celebrated less. So, you know, for example, there's these trends. I, I did a whole article on this like months ago on my blog about how, you know, we tried to basically circumvent every possible trend on this movie for better or for worse. And knowing some of it might not work, but just in the spirit. Well, four by three, I would argue, is a trend. Sure. Well, you could say it, it's sort of having a, a moment right now. Sure. Yeah. But like we, you know, we shot in 2K, you know, we shot in ProRes. Like oh, everything I've ever shot before is like raw 4K. Everybody wants 6K. Yeah. It has to be anamorphic it all looks the same. You know, you go on Instagram, you go on you know, Visco, whatever app you want to use and, and look at great cinematographers. And and there are, to me, the distinction between a, a really good cinematographer and a really amazing cinematographer is, are they experimenting and just pushing the boundary? And I think it's really easy now for people, it's easier than ever for people to go through a checklist and say, okay, it has to be if we have the Kawa anamorphic lenses and we pair them with this sensor. And by the way, I'm all for those lenses are great, but you pair, you know, the same lenses everyone's using on the same sensor and you light it the same way and you grade it the same way and you lift the shadows in the same way in post. And it it's, looks good. It's not that it doesn't look good, but I just like something different it's just my taste like i just like when people try something new even if it doesn't work so for me again there's probably plenty of stuff that we did that that maybe people are going to look at and some people may love it other people may think it didn't work and that's totally okay but i can for me personally like you know again i can go to sleep well at night knowing that i at least tried something new even if it fell flat you know that that's always my philosophy i'd rather fall flat trying to do something innovative than than to you know have have any any sort of guarantee of of success not that there's such a thing um sort of copying whatever the the blueprint may be so that's just again it's just a philosophy thing yeah definitely and i think you can take that project by project right i think there are times when it's fun and interesting to experiment in a more formal way and there are plenty of times where I think Goran and I both are like more preoccupied with uh, ignoring that part of the equation, right? Yes. Like I, I want the fewest possible things in the way between uh, the image that we're delivering and what I'm trying to make. Yes. So like yep. let it be 16 by nine because of course it's just, it's just kind of sure. default standard boilerplate yeah. as a way of saying out of the way, you yep. know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And maybe, I agree that like you're not seeing a lot of technical experimentation because 
why shoot on anything other than the Alexa, you know, and why shoot on anything other than like Master Primes or whatever, you know, if you're doing a commercial. Like, yeah, I, uh, I would actually, I, I would argue actually that um, I think everything just looks the same because of the quality of tools is so high that like I was joking about how you could have intercut like the Black Magic or some mini with that Alexa. And you no one, you, you could, could though. you could, oh, you definitely yeah. could, and you yep. wouldn't notice, right? Yep. Like but, some people will, but uh, sorry, I cut yeah. you off for him. But, but do you're you know not, what I'm you're saying? not right. pushing technically anymore because it seems a little hard to keep pushing, right? Like eight k, ten k, whatever. Um, but people, I think where people are experimenting is formats. You know, like yeah, you do have a sh- show like Bandersnatch or whatever. You know, on Netflix where it's like interactive, or you're. Yeah skipping years and seasons with game of thrones or you're making shows about shows like yes oh yeah it's I less mean, about there's i feel like it is a heyday especially if you look at like the digital world of like experimentation in terms of format but you're right not so much in terms of visuals where yes everyone can kind of have that look of the latest james bond film so and i i we're totally, not pushing anymore and i i because you can download <laughs> No. <laughs> yeah, my my well, luck. Yeah. Yeah. Golden Cine eye. Color. <laughs> um, no, I totally I totally agree with you, but my only like I guess counter to that, it's not that there is not experimentation. It's just with the volume of content that we have. Like th- think about like if if we had a visual of a graph of like 1965, like how many movies are made that year versus like 2019 Mm -hmm. you know it it would be like a dot compared to the sea of content being made especially once you factor in streaming and netflix and everything um so yes you're absolutely right there are these what i would look at is like exceptions to the rule where people are it's not like there's no one else out there that's that's being super creative or innovative but it's just that with the the vast sea of content being made right now i wish that that was not the exception, but it was the rule. And there were periods of time when I think that was that. I think, you know, the ni- early 90s, I think there was like this amazing renaissance for American independent filmmaking. Obviously, there's, like I said, the French New Wave, there's um, German Expressionism, there's all these different uh, moments in film history where these amazing things were happening and the format and the medium was being challenged in a way that it never had been. Mm -hmm. And it was being done with like one, one hundred thousandth probably of the amount of stuff that's actually being made. So, so again, it's not that it doesn't exist, but you know, I, I, I'd like to see more of it. I mean, I think honestly, it's not celebrated. Exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. I, I would argue, um, that there's a ton of really experimental stuff out there. Right. But that, because the uh, signal to noise ratio is all out of whack, right? Like mm-hmm. how many films were being made just in general in 1968 exactly. relative to like, you know, how many mind blowing, you know, French new wave films are being made then. Yes. Right. It's easier to, to source those, right? There's less competition to be like, Oh, okay. I'm going to go to the art house. Right. Yep. And so our real issue is that if you've only got so much real estate in terms of, promotional and marketing space on iTunes or Amazon or where people are really consuming all of this content, even though it's all there in those libraries. Like Amazon has an incredible like library of independent cinema right now, plenty of which is like probably pretty mind blowing. And we just don't even like search for it because you don't know to, do you know what I mean? Absolutely. And I think to Amazon's credit, the one thing that uh, I've experienced this actually with my feature. So we, um, we had offers from lower tier distributors with this mm-hmm. super low budget. We made the movie for $12,000. It was, it was a, essentially a no budget movie and we did get offers. Uh, we heard from a bunch of different distributors. Where did you premiere? Uh, we just did it here at dances with films. Okay. Uh, so we got a screening at the Chinese theater. Mm-hmm. Literally the whole plan from the beginning was, was basically self distribute submitted to like, eight festivals it wasn't it wasn't meant to Mm -hmm. it's very different when you you say eight festivals do you mean the big ones and then also a few other or were you going for discovery festivals only no yeah the only big festival we submitted to was sundance knowing it was the lottery ticket festival um and then everything else was was sort of like mid-tier um mainly just because by the time the the film was finished it kind of timed out that way it was after Mm -hmm. like even what we sent to sundance was like super super early and rough so by the time we actually had something that was 
solid and presentable. We were kind of past that like fall deadline period. And anyway, and and it was really supposed to be from the get-go an experiment of like, this isn't supposed to be something that we aggressively target festivals with, or we go after these big distributors. Let's make something for nothing. Let's see if we can make some money off of it, figure out how to use Facebook advertising and social media advertising and do it totally ourselves. So even after getting some offers, including one offer, um, which was very tempting um, because this one particular distributor wanted to essentially retro finance the film. So they would have effectively paid the, the money back right off the bat, um, but then they would have been an equal partner. Um, but anyway, e- even after all was said and done, we decided let's let's just put it online. Let's see what happens. It's now on many different platforms, um, most of which I've actually advertised for actively. The one platform I've never advertised for is Amazon, and uh, it has performed far better than any other platform, not only on terms of prime like streaming, Mm -hmm. but also in terms of the actual literal like independent purchases as a transactional VOD platform. Mm -hmm. So I think the reason is, you know, Amazon takes what what people refer to as the long tail approach. Sure. So they're all about like, what's the 95% of movies that everybody else is forgetting about? And iTunes isn't promoting these movies. Netflix isn't buying these movies. So that's where their sweet spot is. So, you know, not that it's perfect, but I think they're the closest thing that we have to a good discovery platform for these like no budget, micro budget movies. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, Can I ask, are you, uh, did you make money? So yeah, yeah. I mean, did you edit it and color it and do the sound mix and the score? I did everything. I did everything. But I love doing it. That's the thing. I love doing it. Um, You know, I, I, again, I'm fortunate to have a, a great business. And at the time that I, I shot that film, I actually was just launching my second business. And yeah, I could have uh, forked over the the money for a sound designer. I could have had another editor come on board. But my rule of thumb is if it's something I like doing or something that maybe I don't like doing, but I can at least learn from the process and I haven't mm-hmm. tried it once myself, then I'm going to, I'm going to try it, you know? So on that film, like I've never done sound design before. I did it on that film. I realized I actually like doing it. I'm super, again, I'm, I'm proud to be a jack of all trades. I love knowing sound design. Like I love being able to open up After Effects and, and move the keyframes around and animate the title sequence. Like it's not that I want to do that on every project on my commercial projects. I certainly don't do I, I, you know, that's where I literally often just step in as a director or as a producer, but on something like that, it was like, that's, that's my wheelhouse is like, what's fascinating to me about you is that I think that there are, we all kind of create like archetypes in our heads of like different types of filmmakers. Right. Yeah. And what's fascinating to me about you is that you're both artsy fartsy, right? Yeah. Um, French which new wave. Come on. Which I don't mean pejoratively, but you know. Yeah, yeah. Like, I know. I love, you know, I love minimalist. You, you know, foreign cinema, all, all that, right? And also hyper technical. Yes. Which is a an interesting combination that I, I think is rare. I don't know that we've had that on the show so much. So, well, that's interesting. I, I guess no one's ever quite put it that way to me, but I, I think no one's called you <laughs> artsy farts or and hyper technical uh, in, individually, yeah. but not in the same we sense, making, but it's true. You're it's, a hippie nerd. I right? am. I am. I, <laughs> so, so I think the reason why that's happened is I, I've actually growing up, I was never a technical person. I remember you know, I always think back to like in high school, if, if the TV wasn't working, like I I didn't even know how to like plug in the cable box into like, I had to call my brother to help Mm -hmm. or something. Um, and over time I realized that understanding the technical aspect of the craft was tremendously liberating creatively because I was able to do more myself. I was able to work on things that still I could make look to my opinion look great Mm -hmm. without having to hire people that I couldn't afford to do Mm -hmm. those things. So it wasn't that I grew up like loving the technical, like I I said, it's just a DIY thing. Yeah, exactly. I think the real thing to lament just in terms of the industry is just that there's no middle ground anymore, Mm -hmm. right? Like micro budget indie is still incredible and really thriving, right? Like I think the quality level in, 
a certain sense has gone up just because cameras are so accessible that you can get a GH2 and get an image out of it for, you know, um, with $10,000 is incredible. And then, you know, big movies are big movies are big movies, but it's that like middle range of your $10 million comedy that's just, or 30 million or 50 million that's just gone away basically. It's true. Yeah. And I think where that's frustrating for me is it's gone away, not only in terms of the financing of those kind of movies, but also in terms of the exhibition, because there are still movies like that getting made, but those are more so competing with movies that someone like me is making for $10,000 than they are competing with the $200 million franchise film. Sure. Because a lot of those, and maybe not like the $50 million movies, but you know, a a movie made for two or $3 million, it's it's rare that that's going to get any sort of theatrical release unless it's very limited um so there's not all that much of of a difference in terms of the actual exhibition of it which is both it's kind of this dichotomy where it's kind of good if you're starting and you're making no budget movies because you're on the same level in a sense in terms of your your ability to to share it with with other people but it's very frustrating when you do reach the point where you want to grow out of that ultra micro budget range and you do want money because at the end of the day investors uh you know it's like the age-old thing and everyone in in hollywood that you meet will tell you like it's easier to raise money for the the 200 million dollar film than it is to raise five hundred thousand dollars because what investor is going to believe that they can make any sort of roi on a five hundred thousand dollar indie you know yeah why would you think that you could even make a movie for that much? Exactly. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's 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 a weird time, but I do think it's it's changing. And and being the optimist that I am, I think what we'll see more of, and I hope to see more of, are um, a couple of things. Like one, uh, we're seeing some filmmakers now uh, not crowdfund, but crowd invest in their films, mm-hmm. uh, which is very interesting. Sure. There's WeFunder now. Have you seen WeFunder? Oh, I ha- yeah, yeah, I've seen that platform. Very curious about it. Yeah. Yeah. Help me buy another Wii. It's been yeah. a while. Yeah, yeah. Well, someone I had on the podcast, uh, Jim Cummings. Have you guys had sure. him on? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've known Jim for a long time. Yeah, I mean, we so, probably had him on way before you had him on. Yeah, probably. So <laughs> we, we had him before the feature, but after the short. So he's yeah. he's doing that, from what I remember from our discussion. I think he's basically raising money through uh, some sort of like crowd equity, you know, and mm-hmm. and I think so that's one thing. But then the other thing and the other angle that people take is And that's legal because there used to be a time when that was like Yeah, post legally. Obama actually. Like now um he changed some specific the rule basically that kept people from being able to crowd invest. Yeah. Yeah, shifted it, yeah when I was in like raising 2014. money twenty fourteen for my first feature, I was like, why don't we just go on Craigslist and say, Hey, who wants to invest in this movie? Yeah. yeah. And everyone's like, Do not do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. It used to be illegal and now um through like the trade commission is illegal yeah yeah so, so you can do so you can sites do that like we funder but yeah. you can yeah. also do what you guys are doing or what i'm doing it doesn't have to be building an audience around filmmaking but you can have what you know the the well-known article that we've probably all read a thousand true fans i, I i'm blanking on on the name of the writer now but it's a short article yeah you can you can pull it up or um, it's a short article that essentially makes the case for Kevin Kelly. Yes. The yeah. technium. So it basically makes the case for, um, not, you no longer need a, a massive, sure. massive, massive audience. All you need is a thousand people who will basically buy every single thing that you release, which means you'll probably have another few thousand that, uh, are sure. surrounding that thousand that kind of like your stuff and another 10,000 that maybe like it. But if you have that thousand people and every year, you know, they're going to spend, you know, a hundred bucks on whatever Mm -hmm. you're doing, like that's a six figure salary from those thousand individuals. And you can build that community around a shared interest. So which in LA is like still below the poverty line, unfortunately. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. But in the rest of the, the world, I mean, it's not. And, and, you know, that's also a launching off point and that's sort of the, the, the basis for a lot of people. It's like, you don't want to rely on making, you know, every, I think most people want to grow and want to change, mm-hmm. but if you're starting from a place where you're making 
hundred thousand dollars a year and you know for us living in la we we may get a little a little jaded but but most people probably listening to this podcast you know are working super super hard to to make that kind of money or to not make that kind of money so like the idea of being able to connect with with a relatively small group of people that really love what you're doing you can create something that they value and they can support your work like you guys have a patreon right sure so i mean I, I think also it's important to think about though that hundred thousand dollars that's gross that's not, not net oh right? yeah yeah of right. course so um, and but but uh, by the way also I'm throwing out the hundred that that's off the top of my head you may have a product that sells for five hundred dollars you may have sure. a product that sells for a thousand dollars you know so and it's or ninety nine ninety nine ninety nine and even if you need um you know three thousand people you know mm-hmm. and you're making three hundred thousand dollars a year gross so like three thousand people is still like one in ten million people or whatever sure. it is yeah, on the yeah. planet so if one in ten million people doesn't like what you're doing or and is not interested in following what you're doing then maybe something's not quite you know clicking yet that's that's my philosophy and i think everybody like no matter how specific your interest may be no matter how subgenre your mm-hmm. taste may be in films there's there's people out there that are kind of interested in it too sure. you know yeah, yeah yeah we talk about our viewership a lot in the numbers which you know are, as you know are pretty impossible to like Very pinpoint difficult especially with podcasts the blog is easier but yeah yeah, yeah but blog, one, boy, one of the I'm interesting so things yeah is that uh through apple podcasts uh, itunes connect i think it's called you get the average listening time per episode. Yes. And ours is like usually somewhere hovering somewhere around 62 minutes. So we tell people like, you know, regardless of how many people are listening, like they are listening for a very long time. It's not like a YouTube video or a 30 second commercial or something. I mean, people are investing an hour into listen to it. (laughs) Listening to us drone on. Oh boy. No, no, no. But that's the thing is they get to know you guys, your personality, your work, and they value that camaraderie and it's it's like you look at someone like uh joe rogan who has uh, if not the top sure. you know podcast one of the top probably three and what i do know though is that you know 100 million people are listening to his podcast sure. right so he's doing something right and i do know that um someone like him with that platform it's like it's not about the guests like it's not like when i listen i I, i'm a huge howard stern fan like i've listened to him since i was like you know too young to be listening to him and when I listen to his interviews, even though he's arguably the best interviewer ever, in my opinion, well, um, ever not not you guys are better. Obviously, yeah, okay, cool. he's number two. <laughs> Thank you. Guys. you. Um, but yeah, Three, I mean, like you hear you hear his interviews and they're fascinating. But at the same time, I tune in because it's like I know Paul McCartney's on, or I know it's whoever. It's it's a filmmaker. Stormy right? Daniels. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so so I think. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting when you talk about the the length of like view listenership or whatever mm-hmm. for your episodes because it has a lot less to do with your guests probably than it does with you guys, which is a testament to what you're doing and and yeah. you know. And when the we pride ourselves podcast. with you being the exception is getting guests that aren't famous. <laughs> oh yeah, oh, well, I, if if I'm considered famous, then we're all in in a lot of <laughs> trouble. <laughs> um, uh, but we try to get the yeah we 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 were like the. We talk, what do we call it? The middle class of directing. Yeah, yeah, basically. They've worked on things you've heard of, but you don't know their name. If there's a mission statement, yeah, it's that. Well, we should probably wrap things up. Yeah. Um, All right. At the end of our show, we we do endorsements, unpaid endorsements. Unpaid endorsements. I like to endorse things that probably 99% of people know about, but this is for that one percenter. Something I've been using a lot over the holiday weekend. It was just, we celebrate Passover and Easter, and there's a lot of, a lot of uh, driving around Best Southern activities. California. Sure. Uh, everyone knows about the Google Maps set reminder feature, right? Set rem- remind I me to don't leave. Know. Remind me. I I don't think I've used it. I've heard of it, but I've never used Basically, it. Basically, so I know I need to be at my parents' house in your Belinda tomorrow at six p.m. and I'm trying to schedule something for tomorrow morning. I want to know what time I need to leave, and because the traffic right now, at least in LA, has absolutely nothing to do with what the traffic will be like tomorrow. So I can say, set a reminder and say, I want to be in your Belinda at 6 p.m. And it will say, and I think of driving to your Belinda as like a 50 minute thing, but it'll say like, oh, I'm going to remind you at 420 to leave because there's going to be a lot of traffic tomorrow. Is this in Google Maps? Yeah, but what's annoying about it, and I guess why it's even worth mentioning is because 
It doesn't say like the name of it isn't show me how long it will take tomorrow. And when you're looking for directions, you can't set arrival time. You have to choose remind me to leave. And then it'll ask you either what time you want to leave or what time you want to arrive. And you can say what time you want to arrive and it'll calculate backwards when it should tell you to Mm. leave your house. And it's totally accurate. Um, And it's for, we talk about this a lot on the podcast, but for a place like LA where traffic can make the difference between a 30 minute drive and a two hour drive. Yes. It's like really useful. And over the weekend we just used it a ton and it was, it was awesome. We got everywhere more or less on time, time. but we would have been like hours late if we hadn't used it. (laughs) So set reminder to leave. And once you click that, it'll ask you what time you want to arrive someplace and then it'll calculate how long it will take there at the time you're traveling. That's brilliant. Based on, you know, historical information like Saturdays on this date or whatever in this month. So smart. summer break so or spring wild. break. It knows there's a lot of yeah. algorithm going on. That's awesome. Okay, Matt. Rad. Well, so mine's a two parter. Um, the Criterion channel just launched relatively recently. It's a real treat. It's on a cable channel? No, 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 no. It's on um, another streaming service. The thing that's interesting about it is that to me, it's not a true like replacement for Netflix, Hulu, and all those other streamers, right? Uh, to me, it represents kind of the new um, style of streaming services where it's about curation. Do you know what I mean? It's not on like movie in that way, yes. right? Yeah. And so I think that we're going to see more and more smaller channels, smaller subscription services with a smaller um, subscription fee that are just repurposing library content and showing you like, hey, this is just the thing that you should have gotten around to watching, you know, years ago. Here it is front and center and it'll be gone in, you know, two months or whatever. Like movie has like the 30 days, 30 days. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. And how much does it cost? It's like you can do the annual rate. They were just doing like a special based off of like um, relaunching it because it kind of came out of when Filmstruck went away. Um, so it's like, like 130 bucks for the year, something like that. Not crazy, but the thing that's awesome about it is that they'll do, they'll curate lists that are really handy, whether it's kind of like stuff that you've never gotten around to or linked with, uh, current events. So like, for instance, the obvious one is like, they have an Agnes Varda like playlist and it's like, oh, she just died relatively recently. I don't know enough about her. I haven't seen her stuff or maybe I want to like catch up that's the place to kind of see those sorts of films basically. And so that's a real treat. I've been digging in on that, enjoying it. And so people still watch movies you're saying? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Every once in a while they do. Um, And then also I broke down and got a new Apple TV because I've been watching everything on my PlayStation and Criterion channel wasn't on PlayStation. So I was like, okay. And it looks pretty nice, right? It's awesome. It's someone like, do you, was this was it on our podcast where someone said that Apple TV Netflix looks way better than like any yes, other version it does. of Netflix? Somebody I've did noticed say that. that too. Yeah, it's just like because I, I had like a first generation Apple TV, and so the thing I really missed was being able to put stuff from my computer up on my TV, like screenplays. Actually, it's like if you ever need to collaborate with somebody, that's the killer feature for me of an Apple TV is just AirPlay onto your TV is awesome. Right? I love it. Yeah, I use it all the time, but. That new 4K Apple TV looks so good. And and also it does such a good job of like integrating all of the different services that you have. So you can kind of just browse everything. You're not thinking like, oh, I need to go to HBO for this or Amazon Prime for that. Well, remember for the longest time, Amazon and Apple were fighting. So there was no Amazon Prime on Apple TV. So I had had like a fire stick set. It was like a whole thing. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Now it's all over. Yeah. Yeah. So Criterion Channel and Apple TV, pretty great. Awesome. And I'll second your movie. I've got something else, but it's funny because I I was thinking about that too. I recently came around to Mubi, which is brilliant. If anyone hasn't tried it or downloaded it on your Apple TV, it's basically every month there's 30, I think every day there's a new movie. Yeah, how do you spell it? Uh, M-U-B-I. And it is 30 movies a month. They come and go. And it's just, it's kind of a refreshing alternative uh, you know, to any other streaming platform or most other streaming platforms, because you don't have to sift through 10,000 movies to find yeah. something that you like. It's kind of curated for Here's you. Here's the good thing to watch today. 
Exactly. It takes the yeah. guesswork out of it. But um, we've already kind of gone there. So my other thing, and it's it's going to sort of almost be the uh, opposite of, not quite the opposite of Oren's, but on the other side of the technology coin is I always wrestle. You, know, you love getting lost and being late. I do, I do. <laughs> so I have an app that takes me to the wrong location. Um, no, but I find I... I want, you know, when it comes to being creative and again, that's always my like biggest goal when it comes to like protecting the time or whatever. It's like, I need the time to be creative. I need the mental awareness to be creative. And I spend a lot of time because of my blog online, whether it's on my computer, on social media, on apps, on my Apple TV, like I'm always plugged in. And I do you want to guess Matt when he's going to endorse? Yeah. Guess. I have no idea. Can you get him? No, I don't know. Is that an app? Oh. Yeah. Okay. So no, I've tried those. It's been so, endorsed many times. <laughs> no, no. So I've got something uh, probably takes it a step further, which you guys uh, I'm sure maybe have heard of, but it's called the light phone. Have you guys heard of that? Oh, I've heard rumor of this, but I've, do you have one? No, no, no. I don't have it yet. I just learned about it and I'm waiting. They have a second version coming out. So I'll explain what it is for, for anyone that hasn't heard of it. So basically it is the anti-smartphone. It's literally a dumb phone, but that is... Um, supposedly that works extremely well and efficiently Mm -hmm. it has just what you need on it there is it's super minimalist super basic design just white or black Um, you can have text messages and phone calls on the second version i think on the first one you can even do texting and i believe the first version was paired to your iphone or to your smartphone so you could kind of decide you know which day if you're want a bit of a Uh, less of a digital you know interference Mm -hmm. in a certain day you can just take that as like your emergency phone you're going to go to the coffee shop to write you take that phone exactly yeah and so um i i haven't ordered one yet but i'm certainly going to i just have gone down a bit of a rabbit hole of looking at uh there's another one called punked p-u-n-k-t um Mm -hmm. and then there's a couple other ones but the light phone ashton kutcher just laughs at you when you buy it (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) (laughs) Um, but the, yeah, the light phone, um, if it does what it says it does, so I can't endorse it a 100% until I've actually used it. But, uh, if it does what it says it does, I will very likely convert to, uh, using it, getting rid of potentially getting rid of my iPhone entirely. And that doesn't mean getting rid of social media, but that does mean that I'll be able to, and, and I've, I've already done this. I've been delete. I deleted Instagram from my phone, even though I still use it. I deleted Twitter. Um, but but what happens for me when I delete those kind of uh, apps from my phone is I stop using them as a consumer and I start using them as uh, a business person. So mm-hmm. I use Hootsuite, for example, to automate my social media tweets and I can monitor them that way. So by not having them on my phone, I'm not every two seconds checking and updating and, and getting pulled into this you know feedback loop dopamine hit garbage that they're they're feeding us and um and you know i'm i'm a, a, as big a victim of that as anyone so i started with deleting the apps but i do want to take things a step further and and try that light phone and hopefully if we do another yeah. one of these episodes I'll, I'll tell you guys if it actually it was was decent and it has not. gps too which is cool yes yeah yeah, yeah. which is huge because there are some things like ways i use ways all the time on my phone yeah. it'd be tough to, to your phone makes your life better yes we just are addicted to the parts that make it worse yeah right? well, so no exactly. email in the slight phone right no and i mean i check my email um i re- i respond to my emails unless it's an emergency at most twice a week uh, and again, it's, wow. it's yeah. twice a week. Yeah. So wait, you check your email twice a week? No, I, I, I'll check it daily. Um, but I respond twice a week because, um, 99% of emails that I get, not even including spam, just emails, sure. they're not time sensitive. And when they, most of the time, if, if, if the, the sender believes they're time sensitive, they're really not time sensitive mm-hmm. either. Um, so I, yeah, I mean, I, I do a lot of weird stuff to, to get technology out of my life, but at the same time, I rely heavily on technology for mm. my income. So it's this bizarre yeah. situation I've, I've found myself in. Yeah. <laughs> Incredible. Nice. We did email you on March 29th and you responded on April 2nd. Yes. Look at that. There exactly. you go. Yeah. So you if emailed you on listening, April 3rd, you replied on the 4th. Yes. We're figuring out his patterns here. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, so that's my, my very bizarre um, promoted indoor, unpaid endorsement. Unpaid endorsement. Yeah. So 
Well, thanks so much, man. Yeah, thank you guys. This was so much fun, and uh, I, it's cool to be here and meet a couple of fellow filmmakers. So yeah. hopefully yeah. The, the, this will be the first of many. Well, where can Just Shoot It listeners learn more about you? The hub of everything is just my blog, noamkroll.com, N-O-A-M-K-R-O-L-L, because nobody really knows how to spell Noam, uh, other than maybe Oren. Um, noamkroll.com. And uh, I have my podcast, Show Don't Tell. Um, I also have a color grading platform uh, called Cinecolor. So it's Cinecolor, uh, C-I-N-E-C-O-L-O-R dot I-O. And that will be, there's going to be new content stream coming there soon. Right now, it just houses some of my cinematic creative color correction LUTs. But I'm uh, launching a whole other blog and content stream dedicated to color grading. So if you guys are interested in that, can visit that as well and um social media stuff at noam kroll basically everywhere so that's that's pretty much it that's all cool. sure. awesome well your listeners can find out about our podcast at just shoot a pod.com just shoot a podcast.com both work but both just work. shoot a pod.com is kind of the handiest one and we're on all social media platforms yeah. at just shoot a pod and we interview filmmakers yeah uh, about you know working it, it's kind of the craft where craft meets business kind of exactly what we talked about absolutely uh, and people we try to have people on that make either make their living or intend a hundred percent to make their living through filmmaking that's yeah. awesome um again thank you guys this was yeah. so much fun yeah, thank i you. really appreciate uh you reaching out and making this happen this is awesome of course yeah. well you can find out more about me and like what i do at directed by i'm on uh Instagram, O Kaplan, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. And, uh, it's a running joke. I feel like you've got a mental block on it now. Yeah. Well, I, cause in a couple of places I'm Oren Kaplan. You can find uh, me at Mr. Madden Um, or on all social media at Mr. Madden Nice and simple. Uh, and you can find out more about the show at just shoot If you have any questions or comments, email us at just shoot pod at gmail.com. Leave us an iTunes review. That would be great. we got to yeah. talk more about that. Yeah. This episode was edited by Jay McCullough. Thanks so much, Jay. It's produced by Madeline Rosewatt. Our webmaster is Ewan Williams. Uh, and the music you're listening to right now is by the artist Jazar, provided by the Free Music Archive. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.